Hello and welcome to the Lolly Investor Programme. I've come to the Serpentine in London's Hyde Park to talk more about investment funds and how they can help people like you pool your money together and invest in a wide range of things that you could never do on your own. Last week I gave a quick introduction to the three main types of investment funds, that is unit trusts, investment trusts and exchange traded funds. This week I'm taking a closer look at the unit trust, or as it's also known in its more modern version, the Open Ended Investment Company, or OIC for short. There are some key words in these two names, so let's look at them each in turn and see what they tell us about how these funds work. Let's start with investment company. The fund management company running the fund pulls its investors' money together and invests it in assets such as shares, bonds and property with the aim of increasing investors' money in the long term. By spreading investors' money across a lot of different investments, a fund also reduces the risk of any one of those investments going wrong. It's all about not putting all your eggs in one basket. Let's move on to the word unit. This refers to the fact that investors buy units in unit trusts or shares in open-ended investment companies, a bit like this brick here. There's usually an individual fund manager responsible for where investors' money is invested. If he or she does a good job, then the unit price should rise over the long term. But do bear in mind that investment returns can vary widely, particularly if you're investing overseas. For example, the best performing unit trusts over the past 10 years have been invested in Latin America, where they've generated an average return of 385%. By contrast, mainstream UK funds have generated just 65% on average in that time. Meanwhile, funds invested in poor old Japan have chalked up just 16%, which is below inflation. Unit trusts are priced once a day. You can keep track of their prices on some websites and daily newspapers. Simply multiply the price by the number of units you hold to see how your money's doing. Trust. Now this really is a key word because it tells you something important about the security of your money. When you invest in one of these funds, your money is held by a trustee in the case of a unit trust or a depository in the case of an OIC. The trustee or depository are independent of the fund management company and oversees what it does. If for whatever reason the fund management company goes bust, your money is protected. You continue to remain invested and are unaffected by the problems at the investment firm. Open-ended. Now that's a funny term, but what it means is that unit trusts and OICs do not have a fixed size. In other words, they can expand and contract like a concertina in response to investor demand. So if there are lots of investors wanting to buy into a fund, the fund management company can simply create new units or shares. By contrast, if there are more sellers than buyers in a fund, the fund management company can delete some of those units or shares. The significance of this is that the unit price always represents its fair share of the value of the investments held by the fund. This will become important next week when we look at investment trusts, which are known as closed-ended. In other words, they have a fixed size. That's all the key words. All there is left to say is a bit about how much it costs to invest in a unit trust, because none of this is free, unfortunately. Traditionally, fund management companies like to take up to 5% of your money each time you invested as an initial charge. On top of that, they take an annual management charge of between 1% and 1.5% of your money every year. The good news is that by buying funds through an online specialist investment website, you can avoid most, if not all, of the 5% initial charge. That means more of your money goes to line your pockets rather than the pockets of the fund managers. The not so good news is that the annual management charge remains very much in place and unfortunately it doesn't represent all the costs that investors pay. This is quite a complex topic so I will return to it later in the series when I say more about how to choose and buy funds. Next week, as I promised, we'll take a good look at investment trusts.